Uhuru, uh, brothers and sisters and comrades, I wanted to have this discussion with you because there is a lot going on now, a lot being uh, talked about regarding the summit that was just held in Singapore uh, between Donald J. Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. And uh, in most recently, uh, what we've been hearing in media today, this is something that just happened on yesterday in terms of the summit, um, people are decrying the, the fact, uh, the assumption that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump uh, got nothing and that Kim Jong-un got everything and that, uh, therefore, the summit was a victory uh, for uh, what they call North Korea, uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and a loss for the United States. And uh, while there is some truth uh, to this, it is not for the reason that most of the people who are decrying uh, the loss uh, uh, to Kim by Trump uh, is not for the reason most of them are, are claiming uh, it is a problem. Uh, it is a loss not, they are, many of them are upset uh, in the first place that Trump met with uh, Kim. Uh, many of them are upset uh, because they are not accustomed to the United States, or they have not yet got fully accustomed uh, to the United States having to negotiate with any force that they have predetermined uh, to be uh, lesser human beings or lesser significance as states. And that is true of North Korea. And that's one of the problems uh, that we're looking at. In many ways, that's why uh, it can be considered a victory for uh, Kim uh, by, by us, how Africans and other people should see it. Uh, there are many reactionaries who still have to get accustomed to this idea. And uh, so for them, the fact that Trump uh, met with Kim in the first place was a problem. It's really interesting because many of the people who uh, decry the fact that Trump met with Kim uh, uh, began to wonder aloud if he was really prepared for the meeting. Uh, these are people who have usually been in the camp uh, within the uh, ruling class establishment that's been most associated with what they call peace and anti-war, uh, certainly within the Democratic Party. But uh, the truth of the matter is they do not want a peaceful situation with Korea. Uh, Korea, the reason there is something that they call a North Korea and a South Korea is because the uh, Korean people uh, have experienced incredible oppression and it was the, uh, the military uh, revolutionary force of Kim Il-sung, who was the grandfather of uh, Kim uh, Jong-un, uh, that led this revolutionary movement, and they fought against the Japanese uh, fascists, the country that the United States had dropped two nuclear bombs on, uh, for that the Japanese had colonized Korea, and they were fighting to liberate the people. The United States intervened and was... Uh, 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 attacked uh, Korea and uh, actually uh, had even considered uh, using nuclear weapons in Korea. It was uh, the Chinese uh, who involved themselves in that because, as you know, Korea borders China. And uh, the U.S. government was really concerned about what they saw uh, the falling dominoes. Uh, that is to say, uh, more uh, countries moving toward what they call communism, or socialism, uh, and the Chinese Revolution that just happened in 1949, uh, the year before uh, the beginning of the, uh, uh, the so-called Korean War. And the United States uh, uh, wanted to use uh, the Korean uh, situation uh, as a pretext uh, for going into Korea and then use that to go into China, to attack China, to be able to destroy the Chinese Revolution. And there was even public discussions in uh, ruling class media in the United States about using atomic weapons uh, in Korea and using atomic weapons uh, against China, as they had just recently done uh, in Japan. So uh, that didn't come uh, uh, into play, but the Chinese did play a role working uh, with the revolutionary forces of Korea in uh, uh, first uh, uh, 
pushing back the United States uh, and holding the United States uh, to what I think is they call the 38th parallel. And at, uh, the war was, in fact, the United States didn't even want to call it a war. It was so certain that it was going to be able to walk over the people of Korea that it called it a policing action. And uh, it turned into a bloody affair. Uh, and it's the, the success of the Korean people in stopping the U.S. aggression uh, led to a stalemate that resulted in the United States uh, occupying what they call uh, South Korea and the, uh, the Korean people, uh, independent revolutionary forces, occupying what is now called North Korea. This is how they came to be the so-called two Koreas. This is what has led many people to actually think that there's something called a, a South Korean people and a North Korean people, when the fact is that they are one people, have always been one people. But as we know, uh, part of what the European imperialists have, have a record of doing is splitting up people, splitting up countries and what have you, and giving them different names uh, to disguise what has happened, what is their reality. But the Korean people themselves never forgot. And what happened is the United States government bombed uh, the northern par part of Korea so severely uh, that they destroyed virtually every existing installation in the country uh, so that generals were complaining uh, that uh, there was nothing left to bomb, that you can't send us to bomb anymore. There's nothing left to bomb. This is the literal truth, by the way. And so, uh, but nevertheless, even with all the bombing, the United States was only able to occupy one half, uh, one part of Korea that they referred to as South Korea. They placed in, in power this dictator, Syngman Rhee, uh, and he was a vicious uh, uh, force. Uh, and he actually, uh, uh, actually took uh, uh, captured uh, prisoners of war and uh, uh, committed uh, the worst kinds of torture, including uh, using vehicles and other things to pull them their apart, limbs off their bodies and things like this. This was the regime that the United States government set up. The United States wanted to make sure that uh, the, the Korean people were not successful on their own. And uh, so what they did was... Uh, through this thing that they call South Korea, which is now known as the Republic of Korea, Republic of Korea, they pumped all kinds of resources, brought corporations and what they call investments and uh, everything there, so that uh, this Korea uh, would be able to surpass many times over uh, what they call North Korea, where they had bombed uh, people and bombed uh, uh, all of their installations and what have you, and where. Uh, 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 by, uh, by comparison, uh, obviously, there was this uh, quick growth, uh, and South Korea became the example of what is possible if uh, a people uh, was willing to uh, continue to live under colonial white domination as opposed to striking out on their own to be free. This was the example that was set up. And then beyond that, the United States government, uh, using all of its influence uh, around the world, with the largest economy in the world, with the biggest guns uh, in the world, in terms of its relationship with this so-called partner, satellites uh, of the United States, uh, talking about uh, England, uh, Germany, uh, uh, the rest of what they call the European West, the white world, Canada, all of them. Uh, the United States, uh, 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 as I've said, uh, succeeded in pumping up South Korea and then uh, isolating uh, the North so that uh, the North could not get uh, access to trade or any kind of resources from any of the countries. Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, China were the two uh, uh, significant trading partners that uh, what they call North Korea was able to rely on. <clears throat> Then the United States, uh, using its political and economic influence, uh, uh, made it a point to deny uh, the existence of uh, the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea. It uh, refused uh, to treat it like a legitimate uh, state. Uh, it created this whole line. And here we're talking about the South, where you had a dictator put in place by the United States government that actually practiced uh, tearing uh, human beings uh, apart limb by limb as a means of torturing them after capture. You have this happening in the South, but they create this notion, this image 
of the North being this erratic uh, uh, force that was isolationist and didn't have any other kind of relationship with any other people in the world when it's, it's the United States and the white imperialist countries that make sure that the North could not have anybody to trade with and that where they were making every attempt they could to in, could come into that country to undermine the revolution. So the North shut down uh, the country from uh, most of the uh, white uh, intervention and, and from much of the uh, relationships that it would have with European powers. And of course, the United States and the Western European countries uh, uh, refused uh, meaningful diplomatic recognition of, uh, of the North. And again, they painted this picture of this being some erratic dictatorship uh, that could not be reasoned with uh, when uh, the United States quickly, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, satellite uh, the, that they call South Korea or the Re Republic of Korea, began to initiate uh, war games, uh, began to uh, practice, uh, have open practices, military practices using ships and planes and uh, various other uh, forms of military uh, aggression to pra actually practice uh, attacking and overthrowing uh, the government of uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So that's, that's a part of the history that brings us here. In 1994, I think it was, uh, William Jefferson Clinton, uh, then President of the United States, uh, uh, pretended that it wanted to reach an agreement with North Korea. And the one reason they wanted to reach an agreement with North Korea uh, is that the Korean people began to, uh, in order to protect themselves, began to uh, work on developing a nuclear capacity. And this was something that they did not want. As you know, uh, the imperialists always want, always want, uh, want to have uh, a country defenseless and unable to defend itself from aggression. Uh, they worked for years and years and years to make sure that Iraq had no kinds of weapons at all. That for 12 years they were killing Iraqis and, and uh, isolating Iraq and bombing uh, infrastructure in Iraq so that, uh, in fact, more than a million people actually had been died, mostly women and older people and children, uh, before the United States government actually militarily attacked uh, 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 Iraq right on. Uh, and they sent in inspectors after inspectors and inspectors, and then they made sure that the Iraqi government was incapable of defending itself and defending the Iraqi people before they initiated the war. And uh, the U.S. government has a practice of denying certain kinds of trade to uh, countries that it has declared uh, uh, enemy countries, or as they like to say, adversaries. So that uh, even trade uh, with computers and other kinds of resources uh, was uh, something that has been prohibited by the United States. They quarantine countries and prohibit uh, other uh, white countries also from uh, investing and, and uh, engaging in economic uh, activity uh, using the claim that uh, they wanted to keep the countries from developing uh, any force that would allow them to be able to create uh, nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. So if somebody wanted computers, they say, well, no, that can be used uh, for uh, uh, creating nuclear weapons. And they would make it impossible or nearly impossible for people to get those kinds of resource computers and other kinds of technology was denied to them as a consequence of what the United States had done. And so uh, they worked uh, over and over. 1994, uh, the Clinton administration, uh, uh, because the Korea was moving toward attempting uh, to uh, create its own uh, nuclear capacity, the Clinton administration made a deal, uh, said it wanted to make a deal with Korea, and uh, promised that uh, the Korean people didn't have to create a nuclear capacity for energy or anything like that. The United States government and other partners would contribute to uh, helping the Korean people to realize their nuclear aims, and that would open up some of the uh, uh, barriers that had been preventing uh, trade and other things to happen for Korea uh, with the Korean people. And then, of course, the Trenton Clinton administration double-crossed them and didn't do it. And so, and the same thing happened with the Bush administration. The Bush administration didn't want the agreement even that the Clinton um, uh, administration had promised. And so the Bush administration uh, went so far as to declare Korea uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is to be a part of an axis of evil that had to be destroyed. And so they also uh, they, uh, made uh, 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 like they wanted to have some kind of a nuclear agreement. 
that would freeze any nuclear development uh, uh, based on their willingness to uh, contribute again to uh, the Korean people being able to meet their energy needs uh, and also ending that economic blockade so the Korean people can get food and other resources that they needed. And Bush didn't want it. And that's why they came up uh, with this whole axis of evil uh, threat against the Korean people. And of course, the Korean people began to uh, reinitiate this, uh, the Korean government uh, a, a capacity to develop its own uh, nuclear uh, uh, capacity. And so, and then following that, Obama did a similar kind of thing under the Obama uh, uh, government. So none of that, none of that, I mean, they, they, I'm mentioning this because one of the things that we hear today is that it doesn't make any difference what kind of deal you make because the Koreans always back out. The Koreans are these treacherous forces that never keep their word. And, uh, and the United States, of course, always keeps its word, which is why there are people living in concentration camps called Indian reservations today. Uh, uh, and which is why the people uh, in Vietnam uh, had to initiate a war to liberate uh, the total, total uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, so this is, this is part of the, 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 the narrative. This is the lie that's being put to people about this relationship between the United States and, and the Koreans. Uh, what happened, of course, is that uh, when, when uh, you had uh, Trump uh, uh, and the pre prior governments, and I want to make that point, too, because it's not just Trump. The, these military, uh, these war games, uh, practicing invading and overthrowing uh, the Korean government, the, uh, the uh, Democratic People's Republic uh, of Korea, was not initiated by Trump. That, that was happening when Trump came uh, into power. So it's not a Trump thing. It's a U.S. government policy that we're looking at. And we're living in a whole different era today. We entered into a whole different era that, that's, that's responsible for major changes uh, in alignments of political and economic forces around the world. Uh, and this is caused by the ongoing struggles by people to free themselves from, from the boot, from being under the boot of colonial white power. You've got to remember that something like 500 years, uh, most of the people of the world have lived under the colonial boot, the boot of white power. And most of the history of the last 500 years has been the history of people resisting and trying to get out from under that. It's been an imperial history, uh, but it's where the imperialist and white power was the dominant force that held all the power. But now what's been happening is it's been changing and the relations of forces are changing and the oppressed peoples around the world, you know, I mean, we know about Cuba, we know about India, we know about uh, China, we know about Vietnam, we know about peoples all around the world fighting, uh, winning their freedom. And this has been altering over a period of time uh, all kinds of uh, power uh, and economic relations in the whole world. And uh, today, uh, there is this situation where uh, Trump uh, 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 is moving toward Korea. But the reason Trump is moving toward Korea, he's got this, this uh, uneasy relationship with China that's happening. Uh, and none of these are relationships that the United States ever intended to have. They, they, the fact is that uh, they, they laughed at China. And there are people who are viewing this right now, my discussion, who can remember uh, this, how they used to joke when somebody uh, was bad off and they would say, well, you don't have a Chinaman's chance. The assumption that the Chinese uh, were on the, on the bottom of everything. And now, uh, so when, when you got China with more than a billion people and China was closed and, and uh, you have the most, one of the most reactionary capitalists in the world, Richard Milhouse Nixon, who was the president, uh, uh, was the one who engineered the so-called opening to China. Uh, him, Henry Kissinger, uh, the so-called ping pong diplomacy, where now they are going to deal with China. But the reason they go to China in part uh, is because they see China as this gold mine. They see China as this place where with these billions of people, that's an extraordinary market. They're on the assumption that these white people, white countries can go into China. And they even had a saying at one time that uh, given the billion plus uh, uh, population of China, if you just sold one yard of fabric to every one of them, wow, what a, a financial wind, a windfall this would be. Uh, but a man named V.I. Lennon once said that, it, that the capitalists would sell you the rope to hang them with. 
And that's exactly what they did with China when they started going into China uh, looking for, to capture this market. And what happened instead is they got captured. And so China blew up in terms of its economy, and it's a major contending force, you know, in the whole world. And, and so that's why now they got to find a way to deal with China. They're, China is contending with white power capitalism in, in Africa, <clears throat> throughout uh, the Asia, uh, the areas that the United States and other colonial powers assume to be uh, uh, their uh, uh, areas of, of, uh, of control uh, and authority and influence. Now, is, they are increasingly being occupied by China. Uh, and so to the point, well, you see U.S. forces uh, actually engaging uh, military forces at sea are actually challenging China uh, in sea in the, in the, in the, in, uh, the, uh, uh, the whole Af the Chinese Asian um, uh, basin uh, where there are islands being developed by China who's grown its own uh, uh, sea capacity, its military capacity in the water. And so where the United States used to have free reign in all these places, now China's there. China is contending with them economically, even in South Korea, uh, Singapore, all these other places, China is this major influence. And so now they're trying to figure out how to reset this relationship with China because they got to deal with China on different terms than they ever thought they would have to deal with China. China has created this whole thing that's called a Silk Road, uh, where uh, uh, they uh, uh, brought in Russia, uh, and countries throughout Asia and even Australia, uh, Indonesia, uh, and South Korea wanted to be a part of it, uh, but the United States threatened them to a point that they pushed them out of it, at least temporarily. So this is a whole change in, this, in the situation in the world. It's not that suddenly you got a guy named Trump who becomes so smart and, and that he feels like he's going to do the Korean people a favor uh, by going to meet with uh, Kim Jong-un. What makes it necessary for them to meet with Kim Jong-un is the ground is shifting under their feet. It's shifting to the extent that even the traditional relationships between white power that's been referred to as the Atlanticist or the Atlantic, uh, the Atlanticist uh, group is shattering. It's, that's what you saw with G7 uh, because the crisis of peoples around the world fighting to take back their resources mean that there's a smaller pie for all of these white power colonial forces to be able to share. And so when that happens, you have crisis and relationships are beginning to change. And, uh, uh, and now you have a situation where the Korea uh, has its own uh, capacity. And it has launched something like 100 missiles, uh, and some of them intercontinental, which means that they could fire from Korea, uh, hit San Francisco, and perhaps Manhattan. Uh, they have uh, developed a nuclear capacity where they estimate that they may have up to 60 nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the missile uh, test was uh, evidence of a, of a delivery capacity. They, they have the weapons and they got the missiles that can deliver those weapons where they want them to go. And the Koreans were clear, and this is why we're doing this, because we know what happened to countries like, uh, like Libya, uh, and other places that the United States would invade and they talk like they want to be your friends and stuff and they would invade and they kill you and destroy your government. And so the Koreans were determined nothing like that should happen to them. And it's because the Koreans developed their own capacity uh, to make U.S. and Europe pay a consequence. And also you have Trump who was talking about he would destroy Korea and then you got South Korea who's supposed to be his ally. Uh, which is nothing but his puppet, has up to now been his puppet, they know that if Korea, if, if Trump uh, destroys Korea, that this is going to destroy both North and South Korea. And they know now that Kim Jong-un has his own uh, military capacity, weapons capacity, nuclear capacity, that means oh, the game has changed all around. So there's, no, there's not, nothing that Trump or the United States government can say uh, that can assure them that they're going to be able to exist. So the United States gives Japan some kind of uh, anti-missile defense shield, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean a thing. And everybody knows that. It means now that the Korean people can make them pay a price. And so this now gives South Korea an interest in trying to end this thing that's happening, that appears to be happening, and an interest in trying to bring some peace to this situation uh, uh, and making the United States do something that it has never thought it would said it would do before, and that is a U.S. president meeting with the leadership of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So what you have first is that you have the South making a move. 
and the South makes a move by inviting the North to participate in the Olympics that's going to be happening in the South. That was the major breakthrough. And so they did it. And Kim uh, Jong-un's sister actually attended and televised uh, 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 reporting of the Olympic Games showed Korean people in stadiums crying with joy to see the Korean people reuniting finally again. They remember, unlike so many black people who forget who the hell we are, the Korean people <laughs> remember and they want to see their nation reunited. And so that was a joyful thing. And they've changed things on the ground now because now it's hard for the United States or anybody to paint the Korean, uh, the, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the brains of the people in the South, uh, this horrible entity with Kim Jong-un's sister appears there, uh, and she is so welcomed uh, by the people in Korea. So that begins to change things on the ground as well. And then uh, 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 Trump agrees to meet with Kim Jong-un, which is unprecedented. It's unprecedented. When you say who won, who lost, uh, something to that effect, the fact of the matter is that because Kim Jong-un developed a military capacity to make white power pay a consequence for any aggression that's made against it, U.S. government had to have that meeting. Trump had to have that meeting. And also because the struggles of the oppressed peoples around the world have been changing things. And when I say oppressed people, I would even throw China into that. What I mean is that China, just a short period of time, was a semi-colonized country. It had been invaded by Japan. Even today, part of China is still uh, almost uh, controlled by England, like, like Hong Kong. So you, you have uh, all of this stuff changing. And that means the economic relations and things like that are changing. With the economic relations, political relations change. So everything is up for grabs, and the whole world, in terms of the political and economic configuration, is a state of flux now. And people are trying to find their places, and more and more, they're seeing that the direction of the future seems to be associated with China. Then you got Russia, who's, a, who's aligned with China, part of the so-called Silk Road, uh, and other countries, even Hugo Chavez uh, uh, was a part of a process to break free of the control of what they call the Atlanticists, the, the monetary and uh, other systems that had been set up in 1940s after the Second Imperialist World War that guaranteed Europe, Canada, uh, this great relationship that they were going to control the economy and the politics of the whole world. This stuff is, has been uh, under assault. And so we had Chavez, who was trying to do some economic things of his own. You had uh, people like uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who was uh, trying to move away from the U.S. as as the major as the primary currency there. Both of them died as a consequence of that. Uh, and and uh, so this this whole transformation is happening, and that's what took Trump uh, into Singapore. And uh, uh, so, as far as who won, uh, I think what has won uh, is this process of liberation of oppressed peoples. And liberation doesn't necessarily mean going to communism, socialism, anything like that. What it means at this point is that this whole history of imperialism that has been an imperialist history dominating everybody in the world is coming to an end. And that's why Trump is in Korea and talking to Kim Jong-un. And that's why some of the most rabid reactionary white people in the United States, and the Negro, too, I understand, that's participating with Fox, and I think it's Juan Williams or something like that, uh, is complaining that Trump got nothing out of it. What are you supposed to get out of it? The fact of the matter is, it's the Koreans that have been having war games uh, at, at, at Manhattan, which uh, uh, it's the Koreans that's not been threatened in the United States, and the Koreans have never, 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 never said they would not meet with the Americans. The Americans that's playing the war games, the Americans who said they would never meet with the, anybody who the president, the president of the United States would never meet with the president of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So any movement that's happened is a movement on their side to try and deal with a new reality that they're confronted with. And of course, you know, even as they do this, they see their dollar signs in their, in their, <laughs> in their eyes. I mean, they see new investments and things like that possible in Korea. They see also the relationship that China has with Korea and the, with the rest of Asia 
and they're trying to finagle uh, 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 an entrance, uh, uh, entree into that so that the capitalists can, uh, can benefit from it. Uh, but in terms of what just happened uh, and what will continue to happen, we don't know everything about it. I mean, we do know the United States has agreed that's going to stop the war games uh, uh, that's directed uh, at the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, uh, where they, on a regular basis, they use all kinds of military uh, forces uh, to plan, to actively plan the invasion of Korea. So they said they're going to stop that. And then they talked about uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Well, if you talk about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, you're not just talking about Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, the most nuclear weapons probably in that area are in the possession of the United States. And so uh, uh, when they say denuclearization, I'm sure Trump and his crew mean one thing, but I'm sure the people uh, of the Democratic People's Republic mean something entirely different because they want all the nuclear weapons gone, just like we do. We want them all gone, too. We want to see a denuclearized United States, you know. Uh, uh, but that's, that's what it is that we're looking at right now. And this whole notion that they're supposed to get something out of it is just the arrogance of white power that any time they're dealing with somebody, somebody's supposed to surrender uh, everything to them, uh, even people who they've been bleeding forever, you're supposed to surrender everything to them. But we disagree with that, and I think that we stand in principle solidarity uh, with the people of Korea, with the Democratic People's of Republic of Korea, uh, in this struggle to liberate all of Korea, because the Korean people want to be uh, reunited. And I think we've begun to see that kind of movement toward reunification of Korea, just like African people everywhere around the world want to be reunited. And that's what the African People's Socialist Party and the African Socialist International are about, too. Just like the Korean people want to be reunited, just like the Vietnamese people want to be reunited, African people who have also been divided by imperialism, in fact, we were the first uh, that went into the process that created white power and capitalism, we also want to be re reunited. So solidarity, unity with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, uh, uh, victory for the oppressed peoples around the world, uh, build the uh, African People's uh, Socialist Party, 7th Congress uh, coming up in October uh, in, in St. Louis, Missouri, build the African Socialist International, unite uh, African revolutionaries around the world uh, to take back our country, to take back our dignity, uh, to uh, rescue all of humanity from the grips of the horrible capitalism that has been imposed on us uh, as a consequence of slavery and colonialism. Uhuru.